ओम अखंडमंडलाकार व्याप्त येन चराचर तत्पर दर्शिद येन तस्म श्रीगुरव नम ज्ञानतिमिरांद से ज्ञानांजन शलाकय चक्षुर्मिल येन तस्म श्रीगुरव नम गुरुर्ब्रह्म गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वरात्साक्षात्ब्रह्म तस्म श्री और शैल वी डू नाउ ओके सो ए कपल ऑफ थिंग्स विच वी विल डिस्कस नाउ इन द सत्संग वन इज इफ यू रीड or go through the lives of uh, several uh, spiritual people you will find that in some way at least to some point they look different or there may be a meeting point but then they look different many lives many many uh, spiritual teachers so how could this be i mean what is the reason so let me start with uh, the story not a story i mean actual fact but like a story um about the different main division into three different kinds of people who are, who have reached spiritual perfection so there are several paths there's even somebody who said there is no path um at all so we will start with one path what which is you must have heard of uh, ramana maharshi hmm? now in ramana maharshi's life you will notice a couple of strange things one he did not have a guru at least we don't know that he had a guru he did not have a guru he doesn't seem to have a teacher um and he did not practice pranayam he did not practice kriya none of these things but it's difficult to imitate ramana maharshi ramana maharshi was ramana maharshi i cannot become a duplicate ramana maharshi you can't imitate because for him it was not required but it's not the case with many because for him he was already a kind of almost matured soul that came to the earth and he had to only do a little bit of thing to get to the end of it and when we say he didn't have a guru we do not know if he had any gurus in his previous lives we don't know we see him only as a polished person as it is we don't know and secondly he did have a person who used to go and sit with him and try to help him um even during his time before he became well known um i seem to forget his name um he was like Uh, from a orthodox brahmin family but he was little bit like a madman uh, the sense that he talked nonsense sometimes and sometimes he would say oh come on everybody light your incense there they are flying so there is nobody flying there so okay. so this man also in some way played a part not a major guru but sometimes uh he helped him. we'll come to that now let's look at ramana maharishi's life he was born in a in a family in a brahmin family or orthodox family in the south which was not very far from tiruvannamalai where he finally settled down and he was quite a normal child he was not doing any meditation or anything of that kind he was a normal child but he slept but he didn't give much attention to his studies in school and one thing which was noticed was when he slept it was like nobody could wake him up easily like a log 
<laughs> deep sleep. And then one day, he was staying in Madurai with uh, one of his uncles, uh, and he was studying for his exams. And he didn't study when he was walking around here and there. One day he was lying in his bedroom and he got this compelling feeling. Everybody doesn't get that. I'm trying to say that this is an extraordinary life. It's not ordinary, which we cannot imitate in many ways. Mm. And one day he lay down in his room and he thought that he was going to die. I mean, the thought just occurred to him. He was not even thinking about that, but it suddenly occurred to him. Uh, oh, I'm going to die. So then he said, well, what happens if I die? And then he, he lay down straight, like he's seen how dead bodies are carried to the burning ghats, to the cremation ground. So he lay down, put his hands like this and said, yes, so I'm dead. Huh? Then he said, but I'm not dead. Uh, it was not a thought. Actually, he felt that the body is dead, but he was not the body. Everybody can't, we can think about it, but we cannot experience it, right? And that experience happened without any sadhana, without any practice, without any guru. It just happened to him. Which means what? That a lot of preparation has come into this from the past. So it's impossible. There is a law of, <laughs> that makes it impossible. So, and then he said, okay, so if I'm going to die, they're going to take my body to the cremation ground. But I'm not this body, I'm not dead, I'm alive. And he could actually feel out of his body, alive. So he said, I'm neither this body nor the mind, I'm something else. Okay, his sadhana started there. Then he wanted to make that strong and completely uh, convinced about it. So he left home to his uncle's house. He wrote a letter saying that I'm going off to find my father, so don't search for me. And he went away. And he wandered in many places and came to Tirvannamalai. Tirvannamalai, there are two things. One is there's a very ancient Shiva temple. And it's called Tiruvannamalai uh, Shiva. Because the mountain there is called the Thiru. Thiru means like Lord or uh, Mr. or Sri. Uh, you know? So you can say Sri Varnamalai or Thiru Varnamalai. In Tamil it is Thiru. So this, this mountain <coughs> is called the mountain of the holy bacon, fire. So the temple of Shiva there is the element of fire. We were discussing the fire yesterday. No, Manipura, yeah. So, he came to the temple <clears throat> and by the time he was, his mind was deeply absorbed in this feeling that he is neither the body nor the mind somewhere deep inside. So, he was half awake when he was moving around. And then there is a cave under the temple. It's, a, it's not a cave, it's a vault. And nobody goes there. So he went there, nobody was there, and he sat down. And sat down for days, he didn't move because he was he caught in that understanding that it's something other than the body. Now, in this uh, uh, place, which people never used, there were lots of scorpions. So this man I told you about, I'm still not getting his name. He came and told the priest, hey, there's a young yogi sitting under in the cave. They said, we, we, nobody is here. He said, take me there. When he went there, the scorpions, hundreds of scorpions had attached themselves to his body. He was at that time 16 years or 17 years old. No, no, 18 years old. And this man went and picked all the scorpions out, cleaned him. He was not fully conscious. Anyhow, he woke him up. And then he walked and went up the hill and sat there. For many years, he used to. He had an assistant called Kunju Swami who used to make food for him, and he simple food, and used to eat that and stay in the cave for uh, many years till he came down. Okay, so now a couple of things 
to be understood. So then once he declared that now I'm not the body of the mind, I've found that I'm the self, the Supreme Self. And believe me, he didn't do any practice except centering himself on the thought which was, which came to him unsought. <laughs> this is something to understand. Why I'm saying this is today, if you will see lots of people sitting in Tarvanamali wearing the same dress hmm, with just a piece and saying, who am I? Who am I? You don't find who you are by chanting, who am I? <laughs> That's a chant. It's like Hare Rama or Hare Krishna or something like that. Who am I is not a chanting mantra. Who am I is actually trying to figure out who are you, really? Are you the body or are you the mind? By chanting, who am I, who am I? You may get into a hypnotic trance, but it will, you will not go and find where you are and who you are. The first step in who am I is to find out what I am right now. Not imagine I am the self, to find out what I am now. Because if I don't know what I am now, I will not be able to clear it. How do I clear something I am not familiar with? If I have to free my mind of all the negative emotions and all the negative thoughts and all the bad feelings, how do I do that? If I say that I am the self, which I am not, first you have to look at yourself and see how you can change, then the self shines. People have this wrong idea that you, one part of the mind says, I am pure. Other part of the mind is impure. This part of the mind is trying to change that, but it's all one mind, actually. So what do we change? How do <laughs> anyway, um, one part of the mind can say, I am the Supreme Brahman, but it's still the mind. It's only when the mind is absent, completely then that it shines. So to say who am I, you have to be like Ramana Maharshi who at the age of 16 automatically felt that he was not the body and therefore he said then who am I? Notice some of the distinct characteristics of this great man. One is he did not have a teacher, not that we know of. He did not practice any sasana. He came upon it by himself. Suddenly, out of, he had not read any scriptures by then. Nothing. And he did not have disciples. People claim, though he was my guru, and so he did not have a guru shishya relationship ever. And he had no teaching. If anybody went to him and said, I am suffering, I am this, he said, Who is suffering? Find out. Who is the person who is suffering? Are you really, in a sense, are you suffering? Or is it the body and the mind which are suffering? Find out. He did not have a formula. Right? He did not have any practice, any sadhana. So, these are some of the distinctions that you need to figure out in him. And we cannot imitate him. You know what I mean? Uh, from childhood, what happens to somebody can't be done by somebody who's grown up. But good lessons to learn that perhaps one can come upon the truth all by oneself. Quite possible. If he, it happened to him, why wouldn't it happen to somebody else? And how do you know you haven't gone through a search in many lives? You don't know. Only when it happens, you realize, ah, this is why I'm here. Right? So I'm not saying that there's no there is hope. The hope is to find out that in this case there was no teacher, there was no taught, there were no scriptures, there were no plans, there were no blueprints, no disciples, no teaching. And yet people try to understand Ramana because they see something genuine out there. Did he practice pranayama? No. This is one way, how somebody reached. Now there is the other way. There was this great uh, teacher called Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, 
Why I am saying all this is because truth is many-sided. You may approach it in different ways. Uh, you need not necessarily take one part or imitate somebody else. And certainly by sitting down and wearing a underwear and saying, who am I? Who Nobody reaches the essence. Mm -hmm. You need to figure that out through going into your mind and figuring out who you are now. And then how do I change? Because if I don't know how I am now, how can I change? I cover it up with uh, uh, thought that I am the Supreme Brahman, but you are not. That may be another thought. We are seeking for the essence from where all thoughts arise. Right? So, <clears throat> okay. Now the other kind of uh, yogi. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. He was the uh, teacher of the famous Swami Vivekananda. Everybody knows Swami Vivekananda. Many people know. But very few people know about Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa because he never went abroad. Hmm? And he could barely sign his name. Hmm, he was illiterate in that sense of the term. And he was a, a, a priest uh, in a small temple in the village. I mean, that's it. But when somebody asked Swami Vivekananda, if you have not read Vivekananda, you should read. They're the complete works of Vivekananda written in English. He spoke in English and wrote in English, although he was from Bengal, from Calcutta. Ramakrishna was his guru, his teacher. But Vivekananda was a very educated man. So when somebody asked him in England, can you tell us something about your guru? Swami Vivekananda said about this man who could barely sign his name. He said, uh, a speck of dust from his feet could have created a thousand Vivekanandas. What more can I say? He said. So you see the genuineness of this great person. And he started his life by worshipping the mother goddess. And then it became a reality for him. And he was conversing with the mother goddess. And he, he, he had no interest in other worldly things. Soon he stopped the worship. Somebody else was appointed. And he was most of the time absorbed in the bliss of the inner understanding. For him, it was the mother. In fact, he was very frightened of saying, I am the mother. He said, it's good to keep it separate. I love it. He, he even said that it's better to be the ant that licks the sugar than become the sugar, then you don't taste it. <laughs> so anyway, so <clears throat> Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, then after having had his vision of the mother, and when he had his first vision, spiritual vision, he did not see the form. He saw only light all over. And he was also getting one with the light. And then from the light, he saw the mother whom he worshipped, who said, in his own words, stay on the earth. There's time. So he stayed. And, uh, and this young man with a bright face, with a spark of illumination in him, was sitting one day on the banks of the river. If you go there, you can see the river there. Uh, just sitting quietly and looking up. Ah, I forgot to tell you. When he was a young man of eight years, he was one day walking in his village uh, with a bag around his neck in which there were peanuts. He was eating the peanuts, roasted peanuts, and he was just walking in the village when he suddenly looked up. And he saw that the sky was absolutely dark with black clouds and a huge flock of white geese flew across it. That contrast immediately affected him and he said, oh my God, and fell down unconscious. So, you see, at that age, no sadhana, nothing has been done. 
It's a gifted individual who saw a flock of white geese flying across the sky and went into a supernatural state, the samadhi. And then later on, of course, he started worshipping the mother goddess. This came much later, but he was already ready for it, right? Okay. Then, so after this, he was sitting one day on the side of the river. He's already grown up. He had had experience of the mother, what he called the mother. And he sat there and suddenly from the boat came a, a, a monk. A very big monk. Ramakrishna was a small man. He was a huge man wearing no clothes. Now, in India, only the religious people, like one particular sect of sadhus, do not wear clothes. So it's considered a big thing. Yeah. So, <coughs> so he came. Uh, he called him Nangta, which means the naked one. He came. His name was Totapuri. He didn't know that at that time. And he belonged to a monastic, ancient monastic order of Vedantin, who learnt Vedanta, sannyasins, monks. And then he saw this young man sitting with a bright face. And he went to him and he asked him, Hey, do you want to know about the Supreme Brahman? About the Absolute Brahman? He said, uh, yeah, I've heard about the Supreme Brahman, but <laughs> I don't know, but I need to ask my mother. So, Chotapuri, <laughs> who believed, according to Vedanta, this whole world is an illusion. There is only the Supreme Brahman. So, he thought that his actual mother was living here. Maybe he's going to ask his mother. You know, when you take uh, become a monk, you're supposed to take permission from your mother and shave your head off. So he thought maybe his mother lives there because he didn't believe in all this mother goddess, child goddess. He, it's only the Supreme Brahman, nothing else. So he said, okay. So he went inside and came back in 10 minutes and said, yes, mother said, learn. <laughs> he was very innocent. Oh, mother said, okay, do it. He's a great yogi, learn. So he came back. So this man was wondering, how did his mother know that I was a yogi? I mean, anyway, he thought we'd talk about that later. So then he took him to a small room, little hut, under the tree. A, there are f uh, five trees, big trees on the banks. It's still there. And then there is a small room there. The room is still there. Nobody's allowed now. Because otherwise all people will go in and try to meditate inside. It's only this big. <laughs> so... He took him in there and said, sit down. He said, everything is impermanent. These are his words, Thotapuri's words. He said, everything is impermanent. Nothing lasts. Therefore, everything is an illusion. The only reality is the Supreme Brahman. And there is only one. Okay. So, find that. He said, how? He said, clear your mind of all thoughts and fix your attention here. He, he said, I can't do it. It's not possible. So he took a piece of broken glass and poked it into his forehead. Blading and little pain. He said, now fix your attention there. He said, okay. Very uh, obedient. Okay. Fix. Now, clear your mind of all thoughts. He said, I have cleared my mind of all thoughts, but I cannot clear the mind of the mother. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else is gone, but the, the mother, what can I do? So he said, I thought your mother said to learn from me. He said, yes, then do as I say. He said, what should I do? He said, use your mind as a sword. When the mother comes, cut her into two. Right. He said, this is not, po he said, then don't learn. Okay? He said, fine. So he determined himself. And when the mother's image came, he cut it with the sword, which was a terrible thing for him to do. But he decided that I should learn because I was asked to learn. And this is the highest teaching in the Indian scriptures. So, so cut. The mother went. Now, this is very interesting, extraordinary. 
he went into a samadhi immediately. This man, this monk has never seen anybody go into samadhi. The moment you are told there is only the Brahman, clear your mind of thoughts, it takes years to get there. Suddenly he lost all consciousness and he was in samadhi. So he waited one hour, he waited two hours. He had gone into the highest state of samadhi, which is called nirvikalpa. So he waited, he waited for six hours, then he waited a whole day, no movement. <laughs> he said, no, this is not possible. I've never had such an experience before. It takes time to get there, years usually. He said, okay. So he locked the room and came out. Next day he came in the morning. No movement, in the same position. So he thought there is a rule that if you stay in that kind of samadhi for over three days without food, you will not come back. It's the end. Rest in peace. So, <laughs> so he brought some food, opened his mouth and with great force pushed it inside. And when it went here, it got died, went inside. So he fed him for three days, he fed him. On the third day, he decided, if I don't wake this fellow up, this is the end. He's not going to come back. Maybe he has some work to do, which he needs to come back. So loudly he shouted, then Hari Om, Hari Om, into his ears. And then he came back. And he asked him, what do you think? He said, I don't think, I've seen it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and he said, can I stay here for some time? He said, yours, you stay any time you want. Okay, so he, but curiously, Tottapuri used to watch this young man go into the temple and talk to the mother and used to wonder, after Nirvikalpa Samadhi still? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> huh? <laughs> so, one day, Tottapuri got a very bad stomachache. Now, this is a man who has transcended the physical. But the stomachache was so bad that he could not sit down and fix his attention on the Brahman. So he decided, if this body is not good for this, it's better to give up the body. It's very easy. So he walked into the river to drown. As he was walking in, Ramakrishna saw him. Oh, sir, he said, don't, wait, wait, where are you? He said, I'm mending my body because it's useless to me. It's a block to the understanding. So he said, wait, wait a minute. You promise me that you will believe my mother is there? Huh? He said, well, okay. He said, I, your stomachache would go then. Get rid of it. I just asked my mother, he has terrible pain. Can you help him? She said, yes. Are you willing to accept it? He said, yes, because <laughs> the stomachache vanished. So he came back. Then he stayed for another six days because on principle, these sadhus, this particular sect, doesn't stay for more than three days in a place. They move because they feel that if you stay for more than three days, then the roots grow and you're kind of caught up. They want to be free as the wind, so they keep moving. So he stayed for months. First time he had stayed in a place like that. And then he understood with this young man who was actually his disciple but who had now become his guru. He said, yes, there are many mass manifestations of the mother, of, of the supreme being. Mother is also part of that. He understood. So I'm just contrasting between Ramana Maharshi and another kind of person. You see, Ram Krishna Paramahamsa. And now, there are two things to understand in this. When somebody sat near Ramana Maharshi and read the ancient texts describing this experience of Samadhi and other things, he used to say, wait, stop, stop. This is exactly how I felt. Which means he had not read that before. He had come on it by himself. And then when they read out, he said, this is what I think. And sometimes when they read um, beautiful uh, songs of devotion from the Vedas, you shed tears of joy. But he had not read any of them. In Ramakrishna's case, again, he had not read anything. But 
he had understood that what is inside is also outside. Just like Ramana Maharshi, have you seen any picture of Ramana Maharshi with his eyes closed? Can you show me anywhere? Nobody has a picture with his eyes. Why? Because he didn't need to close his eyes. The inside and the outside is the same. So what is the need to close it? Yeah, he did when he was young. He closed his eyes and was absorbed. But then he realized that what is inside is also outside. So there's no need to close your eyes. Okay. The only problem is, for most people, it's good to close your eyes. I wanted to have a retreat in Goa. You've been to Goa, right? And they found a place which is just on the other side. There's a nudist colony in Goa. Nudist colony. Nobody wears clothes. So they found a place near that for our retreat. I told them, please, can we shift somewhere else? Because if people try open eye meditation here, <laughs> nobody will meditate. <laughs> so you can only close eye meditate there because we will be disturbed. So um, I must tell you another incident about Ram Krishna Prabhu to settle the issue. Um, there was a gentleman whose name was M, not this M. Um, his name was Mahendranath Gupta and he wrote his books which is the gospel of Ramakrishna uh, and the author is M, <coughs> the first part of his name. So he was a um, principal of a school in Calcutta and uh, so the gospel of Ramakrishna is the collection of all Ram Krishna said and the dialogues on Sunday because he could only go on Sundays. He was working. No internet, no working from home, no laptops. He used to go every day. So on Sundays he used to go and sit and hear these young people sitting around Ram Krishna. Most of the people who went to Ram Krishna were young guys and Swami Vivekananda was one of them. And he wrote down whatever was being, no tape recorder. And this is the gospel of Ram Krishna. And finally, the master also acknowledged that he's supposed to write it because he would suddenly stop and ask him, did you note that down? <laughs> uh, so, now, before all this happened, Mahinda Nath Gupta had no understanding of Ram Krishna or nothing, no sympathy for Ram Krishna. And he used to be like, uh, in, in India there was one movement called the Brahmo Samaj who believed that the supreme being is formless and uh, in heaven somewhere and you need to pray. There is one school of thought, it's called the Brahmo Samaj. So Mahindranath Gupta belonged to the Brahmo Samaj. But one day, he had a serious problem at home. All married men have. But I've got angry with him. And <laughs> so he had he got very angry and upset and he said, I'm going. So one of his friends told him, Look, uh, there is a garden in Dakineshwar where there is a temple of the mother god. He said, I don't want to hear about the mother god. Is it a good garden? Yes, it's a good garden. It's near the river. And perhaps you might find a Paramahamsa there. You know what Paramahamsa? A greatly evolved soul. Paramahamsa. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Yogananda Paramahamsa. So you will find a Paramahamsa there. He said, I'm not interested in Paramahamsas. But if the garden is good, yes, I'll go there. And then in those days, they had only those horse carts, carriages. So he got into a carriage and he was going. He saw the Dakshineshwar gardens, but he did not want to get down. He thought, I don't want to get caught up with the Paramahamsas and Mother Goddess. And the axle broke. So he had to stop. So he stopped 
And he saw the garden, so he went in there. He said to God, I wanted to go somewhere else. I'll go here. And he went. There was a bench in the garden. He went and sat down in the bench. Then he saw somebody coming from there. There was a gentleman wearing a red bordered Indian dress, dhoti. And uh, it was winter, so he was having a black jacket on. And many, if you've seen the pictures of Ramakrishna, you see him with a beard. But in the early days, he'd never had a beard. Later on, there were so many people, there was no time to shave. It was a clean shave, round face, shining face. And he had just chewed some betel nut, pan, so his lips were red. And he was wearing a red board and polished leather chap shoes. This guy was coming from there, towards M, towards Mahindana. So I asked him, I heard there is a, some Paramahamsa living here. Do you know? Because he expected the Paramahamsa to be, you know, different robes. He said, uh, I don't know <laughs> what Paramahamsa is here. But if you want to have a chat, sit down. <laughs> so he sat down and he had a chat with him. We suddenly asked him, so do you believe in God with form or without form? He was stumped because why did he suddenly ask me this question? He said, anyway, no, I believe in God without form. Okay, I said, fine, that is great. Rishis also thought so. Mm. So this God of yours without form, does he live uh, in some special heaven or is he everywhere? He said, he's everywhere. Okay, he's everywhere. Yes. Okay. Then he said, you see there, there's a temple. There's an image of the mother goddess there. So if he's everywhere, he must be inside that also, right? Or do you want to take it out from there? He said, yeah, it must be inside. So why don't you go bow down before you go home? <laughs> he has never been asked a question like this. Where he was a professor. He thought, who is this guy now? And with this shining face, talking like a child. And he said, okay. He left, but he thought, I won't come back here. I don't want to fall into all this Paramahamsa business. I will keep away. I won't come. But then as he went home, he was still thinking about this guy. Who is this guy? And then one Sunday, all the boys were sitting around and Ramakrishna was having fun as usual. He taught with great fun. He, he, that was not a serious thing, but then people learned. If you can produce a Vivekananda from that, it must be great. So, um, then he told this boys a story. He said, uh, there was a priest in a temple mm, who used to mix opium in the milk. There was a peacock in the, around there which came and drank the milk. Now the peacock got stuck with this milk. <laughs> so every day at that time the peacock used to come, drink the milk and go away. So the boys thought, oh, good story, interesting. So maybe he's talking about himself. I don't know what he's talking. And then he suddenly said, a cryptic comment, the peacock will come now, he said. So which peacock? But sometimes he said mad things. So they said, okay, one of those mad ranting. <laughs> In five minutes, Mahindranath Gupta, M, came. As M was about to come inside, he saw and said, Ah, the peacock has come. Mm -hmm. And as he entered, everybody burst into laughter. All the boys started laughing. This man didn't know why they were laughing. <laughs> so afterwards, he asked, Why did you laugh? He said, Because he was talking about the story of the peacock and who had opium every day. And just now he said the peacock will come. And then he said the peacock has come. That's why you are the peacock. So you must have had the opium yourself. He said, actually, a matter of fact, after I left him, I felt that I had some opium. <laughs> and he continued to come on Sundays when he had no other work in the college. And note down, this is the gospel of Ramakrishna today that we have. And he signed as M. <clears throat> so this is one. Ram Krishna Paramahamsa. And he, according to his life story, 
he did attain uh, the highest state possible in the Vedantic side also. But he shunned all yogic powers. Somebody asked him, can you walk on the river and cross the Ganga? Because you are a great yogi, you can walk on the river and cross. He said, why would I walk? I can get a boat for five rupees. And go. <laughs> <laughs> this is one way, one kind of person. Then uh, Maheshwarnath Babaji, my guru. I really don't know much of his history except that he was a, a close and senior disciple of Sri Guru Babaji, this much I know. And he knew all about all the disciplines that we know of, all the parts that you know of. And he put me through everything because he said, tomorrow you will find all kinds of people coming to you. Uh, in fact, when he first said, people are going to come to you, I folded hands, I said, please, I don't want any people coming. This is very nice here, I would stay here. Don't put me out into this world. It's like tigers trying to eat you up. I will stay there. And he said, no, you do your job, you go. So then he put me through all the disciplines. Now, he couldn't have put me through all the disciplines and all the teachings if he didn't know himself, right? And this is very interesting. We learned the Upanishads, we learned the Yoga Sutras, we learned the works of uh, Goraknath because he belonged to the Nath Sampradaya, which important Nath textbooks. But he did not have a single book with him. This is amazing. I learned without reading at him, looking at him. Now I do, if I have to do something. But those days he would say, oh, today we will do this Upanishad. Okay. Okay, and I'm looking, where is the Upanishad? No Upanishad. You would sit near the banks of the Ganga and start. I still clearly remember the first Upanishad he taught me was the Keno Upanishad. He just sat down there and said, today we will do the Keno Upanishad. The Keno means who in Sanskrit, who? Who are you? What are you? Okay, so he sat down and uh, one, he said, ah. Oh. He started, he said, Kene Sitam Patati Prasitam Manaha. So I listened. And then he said, The rest? So I said, Kana Prana Prathama Prayati Yuk. So yeah, you know. So where is the book? <laughs> no book. <laughs> so, extraordinary teacher who could put books into your head. A given moment, because I did, I've never read the Khen Upanishad in my life. What was I saying? So, and and then he, I wanted to know, Sri Vidya, Tantra, he sent me to different people, go there and learn. When I went to one person who, from whom I learned the Sri Vidya uh, mantra practice, he told me, I don't know why Babaji sent you to me, because he could have told <laughs> He could have taught you. Why did he send you to me? I said, I don't know. He asked me to go, so I've come to you. He had a very peculiar man. Uh, so so the, what I'm trying to say, the truth is so infinite that there are different ways of looking at it and great saints have come from different approaches. But everybody was looking for them to quench their thirst. You know about the three travelers who set out and became very tired. And one of them was a Greek. The other one was an Indian. And the third was English. So all three went together on a journey. After walking for a long time, they became very thirsty. They became very thirsty. And the Greek said, immediately we need aqua. So the Englishman said, what an idiot. You need water, man. What did this do? <laughs> so then, but they were thirsty, all three. And the Indian said, no, 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 we need pani. We, 
what are you saying? So they're looking for him. And finally, they came to a little beautiful stream of water flowing. They jumped into it and started drinking water. The Greek said, aqua, aqua, aqua. And then they said, oh, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Different words, different meanings. <sighs> but the same thing. So there is no contradiction between the different parts and different teachings. They all some suit some people. Some suit some people. But I can't say you're wrong and you can't say I'm wrong. You see that? We um, do you, you probably know that we have a center of the Satsang Foundation. It's called the Blossom Foundation. In, uh, in the United States, in Texas. That to Texas, where everybody has a gun. <laughs> <laughs> they are good people, believe me. Uh, they, we have had no trouble. In fact, the sheriff walks in with a big gun on two sides. <laughs> and he says, Namaste. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I just came to see what you guys are doing. I say, you're welcome, come inside. And then he turns. And he's surprised out of his wits, he sees Mother Mary's image out there on the left side. He says, who put it there? I said, we put it there. Oh, I thought there were a bunch of crazy people here. <laughs> <laughs> then I invited him, we had a meal. I said, we are vegetarian. Oh, that's fine. He said, oh, that's it. Everything all settled. So in Texas, when we started the center, it's a large area. We have 50 acres of land. One side is a river, and there was an old house. We did it up and so on. Uh, we have a tradition in India that before we start something, you have a little Ganesha put and, and the Devi, Mother Goddess. So the question was, which Mother Goddess? India has thousands of Mother Goddesses. Mm. Which one to choose? So I said to this girl who is from India, look, can we go and shop? Can you go and look for a nice big image of Mother Mary? She said, why, sir? I said, we need to start with the Mother Goddess here. Why don't we have Mother Mary? And this is the Bible Belt. <laughs> what is the problem? So she went and got a nice Mother Mary. So the first uh, opening ceremony, puja was done for Mother Mary. Okay, so I invited the entire city of Graham. Chamber of Commerce, the sheriff, the commissioner, everybody came. They all came with flowers. They didn't know what were they were coming for. I said, here is the goddess. Oh, this is Madonna, the mother. Yeah, I said, it's mother goddess. So then they brought the flowers and they put it there and they knelt down. I said, no, in India, we don't kneel down. What do we do? I said, go on your knees and put your head down. <laughs> So we had this funny figure of these big guys putting their heads down. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that the concept is more important than the externals. So now if you have to go to Babaji's temple, I made a beautiful, not I didn't make, we made a beautiful Babaji's temple there where I have a life-size image of Sri Guru Babaji sitting like in Padmasana. Uh, made of granite, small temple, nice. So, anybody who goes down to see Babaji has to pass through the Mary's grove and go. So, before going down, you do this and go down. Mm. In Hindi, we say salam karke jao. That means, salam means peace. Go. Mm. So, and look at me, I'm also quite different. Mm. I wear jeans, and normal clothes. Uh, I eat whatever food comes to me. And I do my job. So, the outer is not so important as the inner. When the outer becomes more important, then we have stuck. 
Huh? So, outer is also sometimes turns into an organization. And then you get stuck like me. There's an organization, Satsang Foundation. Then you can't do things without an organization. I understand. But then you should make sure that the organization, the shell, does not become more important than the essence. We have to be very careful about this. So we have to be very careful. Now, in five minutes, I'll tell you another story. Unless you have some questions. I would very gladly like to hear something about your satsang there in, in India, where you live and, and what is there going on and what is important. But I don't know if you have any time. No, 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 we have time. Okay, <coughs> boss. <laughs> so. When I say like this, it means yes. yes. You know, in India, you should. <laughs> in India, we, nobody knows what this is like. <laughs> Sometimes it's this way, that way. <laughs> and in my native Kerala, where I come from, they do like this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, the Satsang Foundation is an organization based on the teachings of Sri Guru and Mahishwarnath Babaji. And, uh, but we study the teachings of all the great teachers. It's not confined to that, but they were the inspiration behind the Satsang Foundation. It started like this because in 91 I started traveling and Babaji gave me permission to teach. Till then for more than 20 years I was keeping silent. I could not teach. I did not have the permission to teach. Sometimes I used to go and sit before some people who were teaching and wonder, oh my God, what is this guy saying? But I couldn't open my mouth because Babaji said no. So, at the age of 40, I started teaching in, in 1993 or so, roughly. Some of our friends said, now if you're traveling and if you're going to teach, you cannot do it individually. You need an, or somebody to support you going there. Somebody has to organize it. You need a place to stay. All these things are required. So, they formed a small trust called the Satsang Foundation. Even then, it was all quiet. Oh, I used to live in Madhanapalli, which is where I live now, which is two and a half hours from Bangalore airport, mm. but in Andhra Pradesh, neighboring state. I had my own house there. I bought my own house and I built it. And now the ashram that you see there came around the house. The school, the ashram, now hospital is coming up. It all grew organically around this place. First, I was living alone and there was nobody there. And people used to wonder why I was living there in this place where there are no lights, there was nothing, no water. All that we got, slowly, slowly, slowly. And the Satsang Foundation became an organization. Even then, it was not so bad. It was nice. Then I published my autobiography. Okay? Then the circus started <laughs> then, and mm, people came to know and then and then then I dis I found out that was the organization was really necessary because in the beginning I thought why this organization then I said yeah I can't handle this personally so it grew so we had the school for the poor kids we had another boarding school for the not so poor to support the school and then we had a free hospital and then we have now also a yoga center where we give courses in yoga. It's called the Bharat Yoga Vidya Kendra, BYK and there we train yoga teachers. So it's a one month, uh, 15 days online and one month you have to be there. Uh, then you learn yoga, then you get a certificate and you can go out and teach. Not Kriya, yoga, pranayam, asana, all the things that are involved in yoga. So since I'm there, whenever the course is there, I make it a point to stay there. 
So I also, the students also have the advantage of learning some things from me, which normally is not available to them in many yoga courses. Because I take up some old texts and start teaching them about the different ideas about yoga. <laughs> this is the setup now. So we have a limited accommodation, which they know uh, not many people can stay together. But we have a hall where you can have satsangs, all that is okay. But residential, we have hardly about 30 places where people can stay, rooms. So what people do, if they don't get accommodation there, they stay in the town, which is 10 minutes away. And there are some many hotels there and they spend the day and go back in the night. And we have a temple there of Shiva and we have Babaji shrine there where I initiate people into Kriya and we have cows, now we have many cows, cows are multiplied <laughs> and, and uh, so we get good milk, pure milk and uh, we have a vegetarian uh, dining hall uh, which can cater to a hundred people at a time because when we have Guru Purnima and Shivratri, two functions, I light the fire, light the dhuni. So there are thousands of hundreds of people coming. So they can't stay there, but we have enough place for them to sit and have a satsang. Mm, so last uh, uh, Guru Purnima, there were 1,300 people. So how can I manage it without an organization? But I have told them every year I repeated to our governing council that please don't uh, bet on me because I might walk out any time. So you guys manage this, okay? Because my house doesn't belong to the foundation. I'm separate. I can live there as long as I want. So if you have an argument, you must be clear that you're not stuck with it. So at the moment, this is our setup. I'm a married man myself. Uh, but my wife is the principal of the school which we have, which is one and a half hours away, so she lives there. It's a boarding school, everybody lives there, the children, the staff. And both my son and daughter, they got married and they've also left. So I'm back to square one. <laughs> <laughs> and during the pandemic, since I could not travel, we used to have constant online programs. So I have a recording studio also there, small one, where I sit and talk. If you have seen the YouTube, you might have seen a little room with a desk and some books and a window at the back. That is the recording room. Hmm. It used to be the meditation room. It used to be the first. We converted it into a studio. Because with the yoga shala coming up, the yoga center, we have a big hall there. Um, and we are planning to redo Babaji Shrine. I want, uh, there is enough land. So I'm planning to make a bigger uh, place where people can sit and meditate. Uh, you know, that. It's very small, you remember? Uh, for more than two people cannot sit there. <laughs> So this is the story of the satsang foundation. Yesterday we discussed what is satsang, right? Now we have discussed the foundation. <laughs> <laughs> and our foundation is not a steady foundation, it's shaky. Because every year we have a meeting, governing body meeting, and every year I say, look, if you want to find a new president, please do. But nobody has done till now. Maybe a day will come when I will be free. <laughs> How far away from Madhanapali is the yogi yoga retreat? Center? Inside. Inside the center. 
Yeah, but there's another kind of a wellness center that was... Oh, yes, yes, okay. Now, there is another uh, wellness center, which is basically for meditating and staying, study center, where people can read books or listen to... The, because Mandapalli is bec quite busy nowadays. Uh, this is 45 uh, minutes from Madhanapalli, where I stay, 45 minutes. And it's in the middle of a, like a village. Uh, it's a large area. We have a lake and we have the mountains on one side and there we uh, do health uh, courses for people like Ayurveda. Uh, we have all the facilities for uh, the massage, Ayurveda massage and I have hired a qualified uh, physician from Kerala who is in charge of that. Uh, it's uh, meant for mind, body and spirit. It's a centre where there are cottages, so you can hire a cottage and stay there. Have your walks, your study centre, you can put on your headphones and see videos or whatever. And go for walks or sit beside the lake <sighs> or look at the mountains. Or if you have taken a course, we have a four day course, we have a one week course, we have a, a, ten, a 20 days course. I think the maximum is 20 days and of course you will have to pay for it because there are doctors and masseurs working there. It's not very expensive. I've made sure that, you know how it is in India now? It's very expensive these things. We said keep it minimum. You need to run the place but you don't need to have profits put in the bank. So if you look around and check many health wellness centers there you will find that the prices are nothing. Some people are wondering why we are running it. I said we are not at a loss, we are okay. Mm. But uh, it's a good place. This is the other activity that's going on. And of course throughout India we have started planting trees. This is the other activity which we are doing. And we call it Maitri. Maitri in English means Maitri. It means a person adopts a tree. Because even if you plant it, they won't look after it. You adopt, this is your tree, you look after it. So thousands of trees have been planted within the last three years. Thousands of trees. Because without trees, this world is going to end. And it's very easy for people to cut trees, you know. You can't grow them easily. So we started this. Maitri also means in Sanskrit friendship. Maitri. So it says Maitri and Maitri both. Mm. Mm, these are some of the, these are the some of my favorite things. Sound of music. So, <clears throat> and I am hardly there in Madhanapalli. <laughs> Traveling, yeah, traveling. The pandemic, I was there, but now again started. I think the last trip I made outside the country after I came here was to Australia. That was the last. I was, my flight was the last flight that flew out of Melbourne before they sealed the borders. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been stuck there. <laughs> One midnight I woke up and I told our friends, book me a ticket back tomorrow. I said, why? So we have to go to Sydney. I said, no, I'm going back. Why? I said, I feel I should go back. So they booked the ticket next day from Melbourne and I uh, got into the flight and I landed and then when I came to Delhi, I realized that they have now sealed all the flights. This was the last. I think Babaji pushed me out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>